من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأشرف الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيدنا وشبيبنا وفضل في أعيننا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا وأنت فجعل الحزن إذا شئت سهلا سهلا اللهم اكت على أسماعنا وأبصارنا وأفئدتنا فتحا يليق بجودك وقامك يا أرحم الراحمين وأعلم I first want to start by thanking Dr. Shahroor for hosting this event I want to thank everyone for coming on a Sunday, on a busy day I know what's it like or has a busy schedule and I also want to thank the Mishka staff for making this program happen Jazakumullah khayyam the um, hardest thing, I've been in the academic world for about 17 years, since I was four. Um, no one got the joke. No, I got And I tell you, the hardest thing actually, when you lecture, is to lecture smart people. So this I would consider some of the uh, most difficult uh, talks, and what makes it harder when you have an eloquent speaker who speaks before you. That makes your job harder. And when you're allowed only 20 minutes to speak about topic that I normally spend six hours, by the way. This is a series that I cover in six hours. So we're gonna shrink six hours today in 20 minutes, inshallah. Um, you know, Mishka is doing a great job educating imams, producing leaders, scholars. What we did, we formed actually Wasat Institute to be a research entity and to capture the kids since they are three, four years old so they are not lost because this is a neglected age and this is what our focus at is Alhamdulillah Institute is uh, Wasat Institute follows the same path of community service and research and inshallah it will, it will work in parallel with Mishka. What I'm trying to cover today is <coughs> The concept actually is try to come with a contemporary, modern way of presenting Islam with an authentic content. A lot of people are you know, interested in this, in new interpretations of the Quran, miracles of the Quran, and I'm sure if you're on the WhatsApp group, every day you get some new word and why God said in this in the Quran and why he didn't say this and what did this word mean and what's this miracle? A lot of that stuff is good and has merit, but guess what? A lot of that stuff is baseless and has no scientific basis. And I can tell you there are so many things that are called miracles of the Quran that actually not, and the Quran has nothing to do with it. But as emotional we are, we tend to jump on it and this is what I call da'wah by clicking. Click forward and it goes to thousands of people or forward, thanks to WhatsApp, right? What we really want to do, have the vehicle of transmitting the knowledge, modern, contemporary, but the content has to be authentic, has to be scientific, and has to be backed by evidence. And this is a paper I want you can actually find the entire paper is 20 some pages. You can Google it, Chemistry of Happiness, Basim Hamid, you'll find it. It's on our website, wasatinstitute.org. It was published in a peer reviewed journal. So, uh, Alhamdulillah, was critiqued by Muslims and non Muslims for its authenticity. So, what we want to do show that the basis of happiness actually is supported by religiosity, by being religious, by being spiritual. And I should have called this uh, paper actually the bio or neurobiology of happiness, but I chose chemistry of happiness to get the virtue of Imam Ghazali's book, Kimya al Saada. Everyone knows Kimya al Saada. It doesn't talk about chemistry, obviously, but just uh, to get the blessings of that name, I chose to, to have it as chemistry of happiness. And we're going to try to compare today the concept of happiness in the secular concept and Islamically and then understand how what does happiness mean what does it mean to be happy and how does Islamic ritual lead to that 
And uh, for people who don't know what happiness is, you can Google it actually and see if you can come up with a definition. So if someone takes a few moments, just in your brain, in your mind, ask yourself, what does it really do? What does it really mean to be happy? Can someone define happiness? I mean, what does it really mean to be happy? Everyone wants to be happy. Actually, most people want to be happy. Because I asked actually some Buddhists, I said, actually, it's not, happiness is not a goal by itself. That was shocking, actually. But they still gave answers that revolves around the same concept. For some people, you see the dollar sign, and that makes you happy. For some others, it's raising a child and seeing your children happy. For some people, it's career, you know, having a vision, accomplishments, and uh, reaching certain milestones in, in life. And for some people, it's as simple as that. And for some people, go to another extreme and tell you it's just being completely devout, isolated, and having that spiritual I call spiritually high. Is that truly really happiness? We'll find out. So we have to distinguish between two states. One is called the hedonia, which is the temporary pleasure. And one is called the eudomania, which is the background state of being stable and happy. This is actually in the Sufi concepts what they call the maqam and the hal something that is steady, stationary, and something that is temporary and fluctuates up and down. This is exactly what is meant, and obviously there is overlap in the, uh, in the concept. One of the most uh, skilled people who research actually uh, <coughs> happiness, he's at UPenn, he came with massive research, 15 years of research, and says this is what it takes to be happy, actually. And I will define happiness in a minute. I'm just walking you through the process. Said so he really, he had it in the, in the acronym of PERMA. And he said you have to have a positive emotion, you know, as opposed to negative being angry, being isolated, being hopeless, being helpless, just like what most people feel these days. Um, the, so you need to have a positive emotion and you have to have what they call the flow of life, meaning being engaged in life, having participation in life, having the groups that you belong to, having a ministry you belong to, and then positive relationship with people. We were talking about what positive relationship earlier and how some people, they cannot have a positive relationship. This is part of their persona, actually, how they perceive life, their outlook onto life. <laughs> and then, one of the most important things to have a purpose in life. Something that you keep in life, in mind, and you go after it in its pursuit. And then not only that, you feel you're accomplishing something. You're achieving a milestone after another. So that's it. This is a very important report. For those who are not aware of this, there is actually a task force was formed by the United Nations in the year 2012. And it was called the Project Happiness. They started studying happiness, surveying the entire world, every single country, and defining what it takes to be happy. So the first report was published two years after. I, and it's updated every year or every two years. So you can go United Nations Happiness Report 2018. The most recent one I had, uh, 2017, because they don't include everything. But I want you to keep this in mind, actually. They concluded with scientific studies that happiness has multiple factors. <coughs> Number one is the genetic factor, the way you were born, actually. This is something you have no control over. The makeup of your genes. Just like, you know, when you have the makeup that predisposes you for diabetes. This is how you're born. For certain diseases, this is how you're born. Your look, it's the body makeup, basically. 50% actually, interestingly, 
<laughs> we're prone to be happy no matter what, and 50% they're going to be unhappy no matter what. And I will give you some actually my own interpretation of this in light of Sharia in a couple of minutes, inshallah. But as we know, just like any disease, it could be modifiable by the environmental factors. If you're predisposed to diabetes, you may not get it. And if you're not predisposed to diabetes genetically, you still may get it if you do the right things, right? <laughs> by getting overweight and by consuming carbs, yeah, you still could manage to do it. I mean, uh, people have done so many things in their lives. So we have the genetic makeup. We have your effort on how you modify that. And there are external factors that you have nothing to do with. Just like driving on the road, there are certain things you cannot control, right? They're imposed on you. So three things, your internal genes, your own doing, your experience, and the environmental factors <coughs> imposed on you. Deal? So, and in that report, actually, they found and studied, you know, like every single country in the world, literally. And they found that you really need to have the feeling of a pleasure, the positive experience with hobbies or whatever makes you feel good, and then the, save, uh, the sense of having the proper engagement and having a sense of purpose in life. And that is based on feeling safe and secure, feeling content, meaning having enough provision, and having a purpose, and having affiliation <coughs> with a group, having work, having something to look forward in your life. A lot of times, I mean, the ideal thing is like, yeah, money does not make you happy. This is a nice website, actually, uh, formed by a psychologist. I go to despair.com. You love it, actually. So it's like, you know, for God's sake, just give me money and prove me wrong that money doesn't make you happy. Let's try it out. So, because everyone talks about ideal things. Yes, truly, money does not make you happy, but it is also needed at a certain level. Okay? Uh, how much money is needed, we'll tell you actually in a second. So they've literally listed every single country. They had happiness index. And what was interesting that the most happy countries always was one of the Scandinavian countries. They go up and down in that rank, actually. So unfortunately, they were un-Muslim countries. <laughs> and some of the wealthiest countries in the Muslim worlds <coughs> did not really match. I think Qatar made it somewhere in, uh, in 47 or something like that. Malaysia is number 49, for example. And Syria, I think, was number 112. So. <laughs> <laughs> and what is Egypt? Oh, what? what is Egypt? Uh, you know, I only, got the, the, I only got the top 30. Interestingly, the United States was number 12, I believe. Uh, the United States is number 13, actually. They're a lucky number, right? <laughs> UAE is there. Where is UAE? 28. 28. 28. Okay. So Dear they made it there. Yeah, happy. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> so now we're going to shift some gears and see does really religion make a difference? Does it have an impact? So. Uh, Rodawi and Hussein, they both actually teamed up and studied every single about impact of religion and happiness. And what they found that if you're a Christian, you have actually 50-50 studies. Some studies showed yes, it does have impact on happiness. Some of them it did not. Only three studies about Judaism were available, not enough to draw a conclusion. For those who are in research, sample size, what we call is inadequate. <laughs> Same thing applies to Hinduism and Buddhism. In Islam, we had 31 studies, and every single study showed a correlation between index of religiosity and happiness. The more you're religious, the happier you are. One of the studies, and I normally don't like to do this, actually they even sliced it down based on 
Yanni <coughs> denomination, if you want to say, whether you're Sunni or Shia. <coughs> and they did find a correlation that Sunnis are happier in general. That's, I'm just telling you, I'm just quoting the research. I'm not trying to be <coughs> divisive, but I'm telling you, yes, there was a correlation oh, between the religiosity index with the happiness index. And, and it's very striking, subhanAllah. So, what does it really mean to be happy? How does that fit to our concept in, in, in Islam? So, what does that really mean? So, we concluded that happiness secularly, scientifically, is to have a state of well-being with a positive pleasure every now and then, factors to be content, to be safe and secure, <coughs> and to have a purpose, to have engagement in life. That's what the United Nations tells us, right? Let's see what does Islam tells us, right? If you look in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the entire Quran described one actually, in one ayah only, what is Sa'id, if you really want to say it, happy. He did not say happy life. He talked about the outcome in the day of judgment. That is really, he defines that the actual happiness is what happens afterward, not in this life. So that's what purpose, always look for something in the future, in the hereafter. So that's Sa'id. So what did he talk about life in general? It's not about feeling good, joyous, right? He talked about actually a dunya hasana, meaning it's good, it's beautiful, it's stable. There is not really one single English word that describes or translates hasana. It's good in all, right? Same thing we would have in Surah Al-Baqarah when Allah described those who ask Allah fi dunya hasana wa fi akhirati hasana, right? He equally described them as hasana, right? And then on the other side, he taught those who will drift away from the guidance of Allah, it will be the exact opposite. Ma'ishatan bankar, right? It's the exact opposite. It's going to be a rough life, a life of misery, right? So he clearly made a correlation between the religiosity and happiness versus unhappiness. And then this is what we just quoted. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even in a, another eloquent and beautiful <coughs> he described a lot of people think. Everything is in the Akhirah. No, 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 no. Allah promised Hayat and Tayyibah also in this life, right? Those who do the right things following the, good, the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he also talked about the tranquility. That is the fe feeling, the peace. This is also as described in the United Nations report. And this beautiful hadith sums it all. This hadith has many narrations. I chose this one because it truly matches the United Nations report. Man asbaha aminan fi sarbihi mu'afan fi jasadihi yindahu kutu yawmi faka anna ma hizat lahu dunya bi asriha aw bi hadafiriha. Right? This is exactly what the United Nations says. The first element is feeling safe and secure. The second thing is that feeling the will being. And that means mentally and physically. Just that he doesn't truly really mean physically only. Because this is, as we know, right? When you talk about يعني, the eye, and the Prophet doesn't really just talk about the eye, or يعني, meaning like meaning the entire thing. This is part that is meant in the eloquent language, a metaphor. Allah is referring, to, or, or the Prophet is referring to the entire body. Otherwise, you butcher the teeth, right? So the physical and the mental well-being. And then the contentment, having enough provision. You don't have to worry about what comes after. You don't have to worry who's going to feed the kids in 10 days. Enough. And then that the Prophet is telling you it's sufficient for you to live the best, basically. Meaning you don't have to pursue more than enough. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. We'll show that in a second, inshallah. Then the Prophet is telling you to feel 
To be wealthy is not how much you have, it's how you feel actually. To be content, this is the exact wor word that the United Nations report used, contentment. Feeling adequate, feeling safe. And then the Prophet ﷺ, in the realistic sense, didn't say, okay, you have to live in seclusion and to have uh, to be in isolation. He talked about factors of happiness. This is what the United States when said, the United Nations said, talking about family, about having work, about having hobbies. And the Prophet said, said, yes, you need to have a spouse, you need to have a safe haven. This is the exact word in the report of the United Nations. This is what the Prophet is saying need to have a place to shelter you. <coughs> and then you need to have a vehicle, right? And then you need to have like a good neighbor and all that stuff, right? That takes actually the happiness. Remember when we talked about these things? That internal genetic factors, your own experience and the <coughs> environment. The prophet is telling you that happiness is not only your job and responsibility. It's your government responsibility as well. Because they need to be part of this. At an individual level, yes, you can guarantee these things. But at a collective societal level, I mean, it becomes impossible. So there has to be the external environment factors that modify these things. And this is one of the yani, very subtle features of the beautiful hadith of the Prophet And Everyone knows the hadith in the Bukhari and Muslim about when a person or a fetus يعني, in the womb if his mother reaches 40 days, Allah will send What really means then the angel comes to him and determines whether he's happy or unhappy. Yes. Right? A lot of people, scholars, traditionally talked about what happened in the year after. My interpretation, if it is right from Allah, if it is not from me, that actually this is what happens in your DNA. Because the Prophet is talking about the fetal phase at the conception, and it's truly either or, that's 50 50 chance. And I think that's Allahu A'lam, what is merited and what is supported by the same person. So, yeah, it is the DNA, the genetic makeup that happens. And again, I'm not saying firmly this is what it means, but there is an indication actually of the genetic internal factors that uh, uh, science supports. And then at the end of the day, the Prophet ﷺ is telling you, no matter what, what your genes are, the environment you're living on, because we realize that there are certain things we have no control of, right? So the Prophet is telling you that all this is irrelative, meaningless, temporary, right? Because this life is going to end and is giving you the hope for something bigger. And that's the beautiful hadith, which answers actually all the questions about qadr and faith. Uh, we always talk about atheism, which is plaguing our generations. And by the way, yani, atheism is not a science factor. People argue, does God exist or not? This is not actually what most atheists ask. What they always ask about the evil and good. Why things are happening that way? Why is it happening that way if there is a loving God? And this is telling you that it doesn't matter. No matter how misery, how much misery you're going through, Allah will get the most miserable person on earth. Once they see the Jannah, tell them, have you seen any misery? No. Telling you, on the scale of Allah, any number divided by infinity is what? Zero does not exist, and the opposite. So misery and happiness in this life is a relative thing, actually. And in the bigger scheme of things, it doesn't mean anything. And that is the answer about the good and evil. This is actually the gateway for atheism for a lot of people doubting the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I think this hadith really puts it in perspective. Okay, I'm going to try the... <laughs> to sum the interesting part actually in three minutes and see what we do. So, what happens in the brain? Is happiness mediated in the brain? Yes. Is religiosity mediated in the brain? Yes. Is spirituality mediated in the brain? Yes. So is khushur, so is focus, so is every single of religiosity is mediated in the brain. <coughs> A lot of people think, oh, wow, we're talking about spirituality. Yes, that is in the brain. 
Just like you feel something hot, you feel angry, you feel things, spirituality is an aspect of the human being, and there is interface between the physical and the metaphysical. Something has to make you be aware of this. Where does that happen? It happens in the brain. This has been studied where we know now certain feelings produce certain neurotransmitters, chemicals, right? If you're in salah, yes, there is a balance of certain mix of chemicals. If you are physically active, you feel good. Do we have any runner here? Of course not. All the people this is why you feel people. runners high, right? Why do runners? <coughs> it's one of the older run Mashallah. runners. You know what runners high is, right? And if you don't try, you miss it, right? How does it happen? There is a chemical that produces it, right? So we know happiness is a truly a balance between these chemicals. The main one is serotonin. That is the background feeling good. The dopamine is that spike, is when you eat a chocolate, when, some, when you tell a child, good job, it's a spike of dopamine. When you see that good score in an exam, that's dopamine, that's the motivation. There are, so every single aspect we do, it's a mix of chemicals. And that what constitutes happiness. Serotonin for the background will be, dopamine for the pleasure, that's the spike, the joy you feel every now and then, by a certain stimulus. Then we have the cannabinoids, that's the runner's high. We have the GABA, that makes you feel painless. A lot of people, when we talk about Urwa ibn Zubair radiallahu anhu, when he had the amputation, focusing in salah, does that have scientific basis? Yes. We have a proof now, there is a rush of GABA actually, that's spiking in the blood and makes you feel painless. This is how people did surgeries, actually, in the past, based on acupuncture or meditation. Yes, it does happen. Uh, there is other factors. This is, uh, now I just cut into the interesting part and we're gonna be cut off. <laughs> so, the music, for example, makes that a pleasure and makes that a spirituality, actually, center, light up. That's why there is a beautiful fatwa for Sheikh Mustafa Zappa, rahimahullah. Someone asked him, like, when he listens to music, he feels, yeah, and he's spiritual. I said, exactly, this is why you cannot, this is why music is haram in ibadah. Why? Because that feeling has to be produced by what Allah has made it right, that what Allah has made it prescribed. Because, yeah, you can smoke marijuana and you feel like high, it's like, I feel good, right? <laughs> This is why in Jamaica, marijuana is part of their religious rituals, actually. Why? Feel good. It's like, yeah, feel good, it has to be by the dhikr, by the rituals that Allah made it prescribe. Why? Because they're safe, others may not. Right? So that mix is what makes your brain look like. This is spectra scan. There are functional MRIs. This is the most important thing. They had people, they shot a brain image. We have a neuroradiologist here. Someone was coming with a neuroradiologist. Yeah, Dr. Hassan Ma'un, he, uh, he's out of town. Actually. So I can say whatever I need. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's being recorded, so it's going to make sense. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Iqbal is also, right? Dr. Yeah, Dr. Iqbal, Dr. Iqbal uh, he actually has a business meeting. And it's okay. He's so, another neurologist. So, so they, you can say whatever you want. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> so they have the a baseline scan. Something. And you only actually they made it so yeah, I mean, easy and intuitive, so even I can tell you what's happening there based on colors. You don't have to be a doctor no. anymore. So this is a baseline where someone who's not doing anything. They had these people doing meditation and they gave him the mantra. Mantra is basically, who, who would translate mantra for me? It's actually the word, exactly how you would translate it. Repetitive certain words. We say subhanAllah, subhanAllah. This is the mantra actually. They have him say like Rama, 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 Rama. This is, you know. Mm. And what happens after half hour, it was in two minutes. This is what I told you. Zikr is not doing anything for me yet. It's not enough. This is what happens. You can see 
how it lights up actually. Primarily in the frontal lobe, you see there is a change in the blood flow, there is a change. This is, I, if you get nothing out of the lecture about this image, I'm happy. Anything you do, physical, uh, sorry, ritualistic or spiritual activity, this is what happens. The brain changes and it activates these centers, which we call now centers of spirituality <coughs> and religiosity. And the interesting thing, now you will understand why so many things the way they are in religion. They found out that what really happens, it has to be rhythmic. It has to be in a good voice. This is what you do in the Quran, subhanAllah, right? And we have studies now that in Malaysia, and they had a couple of Muslims doing the same things. I hope, inshallah, we'll be the first center in the United States. We're going to team up with Baylor and do actually certain things just for more documentation and authenticity. So, please. Was that one? Here you go. I gave you a question so I can pause and drink some water. Sure. <laughs> there was a theory, post -post theory the repetitive uh, saying of the word Allah. When you say repetitively the word Allah, subhanAllah, alhamdulillah, the, your, your tongue actually touches constantly, repetitively to the soft palate. Right. And right above that, you have a, an anatomically located hypothalamus and your pituitary gland. Yes, sir. So that uses stimulation to that, those parts of the brain also. Yes. And that is the secretion of serotonin and dopamine. That 100%. Alhamdulillah, someone is uh, yani, and agreeing with me. Beautiful. That's exactly. A lot of people, as we know in, in our Sharia, a matters, matters of worship, umur al-ibadah cannot be questions. It is the way it is. Why? No one gets it. Actually, we do get a lot of it, alhamdulillah. I can tell you in wudu what happens actually in the brain. I can tell you when, when you say Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah and you raise your finger in the salah, yes, they did actually see correlation in the brain and it does have effect. When you, see, when you say Bismillah the way you say it, when you touch every single part, it stimulates certain things actually. The interesting thing, some of these aspects have been described for thousands of years. Like how the tongue should touch the palate in order, of course in the olden days they said the center of whatever. Now we have chemical correlation, we have physiologic correlation. Everything I can tell you, and a lot of times I wouldn't say it because obviously you need science and you don't want to cause fitna for people. So, it wouldn't create fitna, but we say ibadah is just ibadah, the way it is. It truly, now we know there is basis for it in the brain. And this is why, you know, if you look at anything we do, yesterday we had a lecture about building blocks of characters. The way the Prophet raised kids, you know what, I can tell you every mechanism he used, how it's correlated in modern psychology, and what happens in neurophysiology. There is an explanation for it, and this is what, honestly, as Muslims, we need to do. We need to do a better job, and this is the whole concept, a better job in putting that content in contemporary words for the young people to get, and for others to benefit from, as opposed we do it, oh, just because we do it, right? Guess what? A neuroscientist who's been sitting in his lab for 35 years is not going to just accept it, right? Now they're saying, like, man, I want you to read this book by a Newberg, actually, Stephen Newberg. He wrote, actually, the religiosity and spirituality. He was an atheist. After years of research, by the way, that Spectrascap <coughs> was one of his products. He actually made a statement, it seems like these people, us, meaning religious people, are onto something. He said, yeah, it's like, you know, maybe they're right. And now, actually, he wrote the book, Defending Religion, that yes, actually, there is a basis for it. It's not just nonsense. It is not just, you know, people who are trying to come up with certain rituals and, you know, just keep busy people with. Yes, more than anything, it is intrinsic. This is what we call fitrah. 
I can, if you want to talk about fitra, I tell you what fitra is. In the brain, I'll spend another hour. Yes, fitra has some religious chemical basis also in the brain. It is not just something, yeah, I mean, look at it, who feeds you and who makes you feel good. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But how? Through means. There is a scientific way for it. There is a physiologic basis for it, right? Same thing applies to spirituality. Now, actually, in the brain, they're calling the left parietal lobe is the center of ethar. Actually, the right one is for ethar, selflessness. <clears throat> Who would have thought this? We always talk about selflessness in a moral way, ethical way. Yeah, these scientists don't get it that way. There is scientific basis, physiologic basis for it. We're going after pleasures and selfness is in the left parietal lobe. Right? To conclude... I have one question. Um, so are you saying when somebody uh, performs the ritual prayer, immediately gets happy? Not because necessarily. There's a lot of people uh -huh. who exactly. the prayer and they don't feel the pleasure. That's why they don't even... What you need to do mm -hmm. is go to yesterday's lecture and listen to it on our Facebook because it was about the concept everything has to be in a routine, monotonous, habitual. It has to become a trait. Temporary things don't do it. Just like exercise. You go run two hours now, it's not going to do it. When you do it consistently, it has to be consistent with perseverance regular. This is what we call it istiqamah. Little amount, but maintained over a long period of time. That what does it. Thanks for the question. Temporary things, yet yeah, you get a spy. This is what you call Iman High, right? We get a speaker, he cheers them up, entertain them, and everyone feels good. And then they go home. It's like, it doesn't happen. This is why people go to Hajj and come back, and what happens to their Iman? Yes. Is that true? Yes. Wallahi, I was in Arafat. We came down to Muzdalifah. Two people told me, Dude, what is this Hajj you're talking about that Allah is going to bring you to him? It's like, yeah, you did it wrong. It doesn't happen that way. It has to be regular, monotonous, maintained with perseverance and consistency. So what would you say to a young person who wants something, feel pleasure doing prayer or fasting, but he doesn't... Okay. This is why we have Wasat Institute focusing on youth, actually. You will see a program, inshallah, particularly for that. I don't think I can answer what I said. This is six hours of presentation. We have actually a series about happiness, series about addiction. Because what happens if you don't go that route? So next time we'll bring you, it's about addiction. No, spirituality. It goes actually spirituality, no, happiness, about, addictions. Oh, yeah. Right? It is very important to understand how... You know, the body works. To me, I mean, someone asked me, like, you know, someone told me she was an addict. I said, listen, to me, I don't look at the people as human beings. I look at them as a mixture of serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine, and GABA, and this. Truly, this is how I look at people. It's like, what's picking up? What's going down? And this is why, alhamdulillah, to me, there is, in general, there is no good or bad. It's all about chemicals. It's all about chemical imbalance. And we need to fix it back. <laughs> Fixing it back is what the Prophet, or what Allah called it, what? Tazkiyah. Fixing that balance again. I don't see people doing wrong or bad. I just see him like, oh, he's getting too much dopamine. We need to bring it down. There is serotonin is going down. We need to bring it up. And the interesting thing, these things, believe it or not, don't just happen with a pill. It takes more than just a pill. Okay? So, if you look, easy and simple. Go next time you're at Barnes & Noble's Happiness for Dummies. <laughs> this is what the game they summarize. Feeling safety, sense of satiation, meaning contentment, persp perspective, quietude, that's a tranquility. Yes. Our Muslim scholars, unfortunately, didn't talk about this. This came from science. But it's our job to say that Islam is consistent with science, and the path of religiosity is the path of happiness. 
I'm going to stop here, inshallah. Jazakumullah wa khairan wa salam alaykum wa rahmatullah. And if you have any questions, email us. You are fortunate next week, inshallah, Dr. Salah al Sabi, whom I consider the top scholar in North America, the one who has researched and talked about issues of Muslims in the West, no more than anyone else in the West. I guarantee you, inshallah, that in 100 years, people will look back, and just like we talk about Abu Hanifa and Shafi, people will talk about Salah al Sabi. You are fortunate and privileged to have him next week, I ask the brothers to put a program for you to be honored to meet him because he's truly one of the few. I tell you guys, alhamdulillah, I've been in this business since I was 10 year old. My first halaq I attended was for Sheikh Mustafa al -Bugha. May Allah bless him and prolong his life. I literally tried every single path. Seeing the Salafis, the Sufis, the extremes, and the rights, and the radicals, and the moderate, to be one of the few authentic scholars you have, Sheikh Salah al This is a book that was written for physicians, Mala Yasaw Qadira Jahlu. You get it, inshallah, as a present when you come to, to meet them next time, which is not a fundraising. By the way, what's up? We're self-funded, we don't ask for donations either, so don't be scared when I come to town next time. <laughs> but, but for Mishka, we ask for money. Okay. <laughs> okay. But what's, what's up the Mishka sisters? We're, we're sister organizations, we focus on the research and we capture the kids from their three years old. On our website and Facebook, please like Mishka uh, yes. page on Facebook, what's up Facebook. We can have a Sira actually, interactive Sira programs for kids. The first done, alhamdulillah, ever. So uh, with that marketing pitch, I mean, I will conclude. Just so next week, 11.30. Yeah, I won't at, be here, but the, you will be At the here. headquarters of Mishka, which is in Wesley yeah. Chapel, very close. Sure. I won't be here, email, but you, you sure. have yani, the big boss, inshallah. Jazakumullah yeah. khayran for attending. Jazakumullah khayran for the family. Was Dr. Naeem Shahroor. May Allah reward all of you. Mm -hmm. If you would like to get information, again, it's not a fundraising information about uh, Mishka, you may get the brochure now, or you may visit our website, mishkau.com.